Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode seven of Growing in God. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we've been in uh, COVID restrictions for, for quite a while, uh, but I hope that this is a, a place of consistency and encouragement for you. And so let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover today. Let me bring up your page because you don't want to look at me. I don't want you to look at me, but I'm on the video. So uh, we're going to be in 1 Timothy. We didn't quite finish uh, chapter 5, so that's what we're going to pick up. But we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer first, um, and then we'll get down to business, okay? So if you join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Uh, we thank you for the things that you have shown us um, according to your standard and to show us what's best for us, God, because you love us. Uh, you're not just a rule maker, Lord. You're a person who takes a lost person and makes the change in them that they could not make on their own, and then does wonderful things, Lord, not only so we are blessed, but that you ultimately get the glory. And so today I just pray, God, that you would get the glory in, in us reading and learning and applying these things, God, that we would be living the appropriate way for you, God, out of respect and thankfulness, and that we would just enjoy who you are and all the things that you have blessed us with, God. So help our minds and help our hearts as we study your word today. Help us to not be distracted by other things. I know a lot of people are dealing with um, kiddos who are doing schooling at home or other household responsibilities, uh, but that we would just spend this time to focus on you. So I pray that you would supernaturally set aside anything that may be distracting us, Lord, physically or mentally, so that we can give you the honor and the glory that you deserve. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, everybody. So uh, we finished, uh, we were talking about widows last time, and so hopefully that wasn't too off-putting for people. Again, we talked about uh, that Paul is telling Timothy this, this rule or this outline for widows so that there's structure within the church. And we know that we need structure not only within our local church, uh, but within our personal lives and our household. And so Paul is going to go over a few more things uh, about widows, and then we're going to change to leaders um, within the local body of, of the church. So again, chapter five is really focusing on how, how do we interact as a family, uh, what are the things that we should or shouldn't do for each other, and again, with that idea of structure in, in the way that we operate as a local church. So uh, Paul got finished talking about all these different, uh, through verse 13, talking about widows, talking about um, what it should and should not constitute putting a widow on a list. And so we're going to jump into verse 14, and Paul says to Timothy, so I counsel younger widows to marry to have children, to manage their homes, and give the enemy no opportunity for slander. So remember, widows had to be at least 60 years old and meet some other requirements to be able to put on the widow, the widow list to be able to be supported by the church. And we didn't want younger widows to be on that uh, because they still may have be of age where they have a desire to get married, um, still at an age maybe where they can have kids, and still fulfilling um, any, at that time, the, the womanly role within the house. And Paul is really telling Timothy to encourage younger widows to do that, because if you remember from last time, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for things to go south really fast when we don't live within the structure of, of God's will. Um, really talking about uh, verse 13 right before that, that we don't want them going around just gossiping and doing whatever because they don't have a job or anything to work on. Um, they're kind of responsible to themselves. And then verse 15 says, some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. So some of these uh, widows who didn't meet this criteria, who were on the widow list or considered for the widow list, and they weren't really interested in, in, in loving God and serving the local church, and they actually made more trouble um, than they did support the local church. So there were some ladies who um, have turned away, if we remember in, in chapter four, um, some people who had turned away from intimacy with God. And so we don't want to put a widow or any other uh, church member in a position where it makes it easier for them to, to not draw close to God. Our, our job as leaders and our job as a local church is to draw people into intimacy with God. And so we don't want to have any practice or any um, uh, structure in place that, that inhibits people from doing that. We want people to, to grow in their knowledge and passion for God. Uh, verse 16, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened by them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. So again, if, there, if there's ladies or family members who can take care of widows, um, they should be doing that because the fewer widows you have supported by the church, the more able the church is to help widows and other people who meet that criteria. So in current days and times, um, ladies, you can, you can still, um, if you're of age and physically able to be able to get a job, to be able to support yourself or support your family, and so not relying on the local church to support those widows. So Paul had, had some pretty stringent criteria of what that looked like, and again, 
uh, we want to focus on that God is a God of order, God is a God of structure, and to do what's right in his eyes and not just what seems uh, best in our own eyes or what's easiest for us. So now uh, Paul's going to transition to some of the elders because the elders are obviously a part of the local church, pretty important part. Uh, verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And so we're not going to spend too terribly much time on this verse, uh, but it's talking about directing the affairs of the church well. Uh, it doesn't mean perfection. That doesn't mean um, that any uh, pastor or elder or even a deacon um, is perfect all the time. But remember those criteria from chapter three, that they are above reproach, that they're not causing trouble or, or having, having things, um, not causing controversy, not always being involved in drama, but doing trying to do what the Lord has called them to do. And so someone um, who's, who's doing that well, uh, the Bible says, uh, they are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Because uh, that's, that's Paul's main focus, right? About getting rid of, of unbiblical doctrine, about teaching sound doctrine, about having people teach it and live it out consistently so that they can be an example to other people. And so uh, people who are church leaders um, at, at Northside or any other church who are doing well, uh, first and foremost, they should, because that's our job, right? Um, and I don't mean like a job that you get paid for, but that's the responsibility and the calling that God has given us. Uh, but also people who are, who are leading maybe a small group well, uh, people who are, who are working to, to be in fellowship with, with other people or a part of a Bible study, people who are leading those things well, um, just, just a little thank you goes a long way uh, for those kind of individuals. And so Paul's going to back that up with scripture because um, some people will say like, oh, people just want to preach and teach so they can get paid and not have to have a real job. Um, scripture goes uh, against that ideology. First um, Timothy 5.18 says, for scripture says, and this is from uh, Deuteronomy 25 uh, verse 4, it says, do not muzzle an ox while he is treading out the grain. So in olden days when they would crush grain and do those things, they would tie an ox to a, a grind mill and they would just go around and around and around in a circle. And uh, God would say to his people, like, that's kind of cruel to, to put a muzzle over an ox so they can't eat because they're working really, really hard, but then they're not getting anything out of it. They're not able to, to eat or glean from the work that they're doing, right? And so that, that's kind of a, a sad situation where uh, someone is working really, really, really hard, in this case, an ox, and then not getting any, any benefit from that or not getting any um, food in a literal sense. Same thing would be true uh, for you whenever you go to work. You wouldn't say that's fair, like, man, I'm going to go work eight or nine or 12 hours or whatever, and then not get paid for the work that I do. Like, that doesn't seem fair. And then so uh, Jesus would go on to say in Luke 10, verse 7, uh, the worker deserves his wages. And so it's not so much about um, people in, in ministry getting, getting paid a salary or full salary or whatever, uh, but what it's talking about is, is, is giving benefit to people who are doing the, the work of God um, consistently, and they are directing the affairs of the church well, okay? Uh, verse 19 uh, says, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. So anybody can say anything about anybody, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, okay? So if there's an accusation brought against um, a, a pastor or a preacher or even elder or a deacon, and Remember, if they're living a life that's above reproach or they're leading and directing the, the affairs of the church well, it would seem funny that someone would bring an accusation if there's just one person. So one person says something bad about a leader and everyone else is like, oh, I don't see that or I've never had any inkling of that. I never got that feeling and just not think that they're okay. But if you have two or three or even more people all come together and say, hey, pastor so-and-so uh, said this or did this and that wasn't cool and we need to talk to them about that. Um, that that's something that you would definitely take seriously. But just because one person brings up one thing that's not supported by anybody else, um, not that you don't listen to that person, but you're not going to entertain those accusations or go through with those accusations if there's not enough evidence to say that that person did that thing. So same thing within the legal system. Just because one person can try to sue you or say that this one thing happened um, doesn't necessarily mean that that court case would go through. Um, but if as you were going through the court case, there were all these uh, witnesses and all this evidence to be like, yeah, this person's telling the truth, then, then that would look bad for that person. So we don't hold court necessarily in church, um, but we're not going to jump to conclusions every single time there's one person who says one thing um, against a leader. But verse 20 says, we're not just going to ignore those things. Um, verse 20 says, but those elders who are sinning. So maybe something that somebody brought up in verse 19, if it was two or three or more people and they had, they really had like enough grounds to say, hey, this, this leader is out of line. 
Um, but those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove them before everyone so that others may take warning. So that means a couple of things. First and foremost is that says that church leaders don't get some like free pass and say like, oh, well, you know, it's really hard to be a leader. So I know you did this sinful thing, but I will just forget it. It's be fine. Just try not to do that anymore. Um, that's not appropriate. And that's not paying uh, favoritism as it's going to talk about in the very next verse. And so leaders are not, um, are not unsubject to having a reparation or being reproved in front of everybody. And another reason um, that, that this verse is important is the last part of it where it says, so that others may take warning. So if there's a leader who is um, consistently uh, engaged in some kind of sinful activity, remember if you have a problem, you go one-to-one -one with that person, hey, I want to talk to you about this thing, I have this problem, I have this issue. And if that person still chooses to say, no, I'm right, I don't care what you say, I'm going to keep doing what I do, then that person is going to be reproved in front of everyone and before the local church so that others may take a warning. So that's an encouragement to, to church members to know that, that leaders don't get, again, some kind of special pass or think that they don't have the same standard. They actually have a higher standard. And so we want to uh, let people know that if there's any uh, leader or um, pastor or deacon or anybody who's, who's not doing what's right by the word of God, um, that that's not okay. And they don't get to do that just because they have some kind of title. Um, that those people need to be corrected in front of other people so they don't keep doing it, and also to discourage uh, people from doing whatever that leader would be doing. Remember in chapter one, Paul's telling Timothy, hey, you've got to have sound doctrine, and there's people who are coming in and trying to teach wrong things. If, if there's someone, and even if they have a title, um, even if they have a formal position of leadership, and they're engaged in something, even if they're not overtly teaching that to the people, if the people see that and they're like, oh, well, pastor so-and-so does it, so I guess that's okay, so I'm going to do it. Um, that leader is responsible for the actions and, and some of the things that they've been taught biblically, at least. And so we want to make sure that we're not misleading um, any congregant, anybody who would come inside the church doors. Verse 21 says, I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Again, James chapter two is really talking about not having favorites and treating everybody equitably. And so Paul is telling Timothy, like, hey, even some of these guys um, you, you serve with, you, you serve the Lord with, you, you work with, um, you know them, they're your friends, uh, you can't treat them different, that everybody is held to the same standard. And so we understand that all Christians, first and foremost, have a responsibility to God as, as part of that standard. And then as a leader or a teacher, um, we're held to a higher standard because we're leading and teaching other people. And so people shouldn't be given partiality or favoritism. Um, even if it's somebody that, that you know or that you're close to. And so to the person watching this, that, that maybe you don't have a position of leadership, um, that the, same, the same thing still goes for you. You know, like if, if you have a friend or a family member that's doing something wrong, even if they're not a leader, you would be like, hey, I need to talk to you about this because that's not cool that you're doing that, right? And not saying like, oh, I can't say anything because it's my sister or he's been my best friend for 25 years. I don't want to tell him anything. Uh, we need to not have favoritism and, and treat everybody right by the standard of God. So it's not just like the deal that you have worked out with your friend or family member. We're, we're following the decrees and the orders of God. And so we don't want to give a, a man or a woman, a sinful person, more precedence than the word of God. The word of God always trumps everything. And so if, if there's something that someone's doing that's out of line with God's will and, and, and really the teaching of the Bible, you go to that person one-on-one -on -one and have that talk with them, but you don't say like, oh, I'll just, you know, it's my stepdad. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to make it weird. Um, that actually is, is the wrong thing to do. So let's continue and um, try to finish up chapter five, and maybe we can start a little bit of six uh, before we get going here. Uh, 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. So the practice of laying on of hands within the local church body would either be for blessing and or healing under some different circumstances that we don't necessarily have time to go into, uh, but that's something that someone um, can request, and if approved by the church, we, we do that for people, right? And so he's saying, don't be hasty of laying on of hands. You might say, like, hey, that's kind of rude. Like, if somebody wants healing or wants a blessing for something, like, the leader should lay their hands and, and, and pray over them. But remember what's more important then laying your hands on and blessing someone or, or, or asking for healing on someone is the condition of that person's heart, right? That first and foremost, whether they have um, an illness or they just really need uh, protection or blessing for something, what's most important is the condition of that person's heart in relationship to God. And so 
uh, church leaders have the discretion upon when they're going to lay hands on people or, or when they're going to have a special prayer service for someone or anoint them with oil, all these different things. And, and really that, that kind of is tied to the, the genuineness of that person. And so I don't want to get into too many details because that, that kind of leads down a long rabbit hole. Uh, but Paul is telling Timothy as he leads the church in Ephesus, hey, you don't necessarily have to lay hands on everybody because you don't want to be praying for someone's situation that may ultimately be sinful, but they're only asking for this little part. You know, it's like if someone says, let me give you an example. If someone says, hey, uh, Pastor, will you lay hands on me and pray for me that I would have uh, favor in court? But the reason they're going to court is because, um, you know, it was, it was arson or murder or some like big, big crime problem. Like all sin is sin. And so we're not saying that like one sin is better or worse than the others. But if, if there needs to be a natural responsibility, there needs to be a natural consequence for the thing that they did legally um, laying on hands may not be appropriate for that person. Even if that person doesn't say, oh yeah, I killed somebody. Now I want favor in court. Um, we need to make sure that people's hearts are right with God. And so Paul ends that verse by saying, keep yourself pure. And so it doesn't mean that you, you don't talk to people that, that, that aren't saved. We definitely do, because if you never talk to someone who wasn't saved, how are they going to know about the gospel, right? But we also don't want to get involved with the situations that they have going on, uh, because that may be something that, that may drag you down. So really practicing discernment and wisdom to say, like, I, I can love this person, but I can also love this person from a distance so I don't get wrapped up in all their business. And so I believe if, 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 you, if you stop and slow down uh, and, and really listen to the Lord about, how, do I help this person? How can I help this person? That he will lead you and guide you so you don't get wrapped up in all of their issues um, that could cause problems for you and your family moving forward. Uh, verse 23 says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent, frequent illnesses. Okay, this is a verse that's very specific to Timothy, that he had a stomach condition, um, at that time in the practice of medicine, they didn't have a lot of the, the things that we can get at, at um, like at Walmart or the grocery stores. You go to the medicine aisle and, and do something to kind of help you with, with a stomach issue or ulcer or whatever. And so he's saying, use a little wine mixed in with your water um, to be able to kind of calm your stomach. So this verse is not saying, oh, see, look, you can drink wine because Paul told Timothy to drink wine. No, that's just saying that that was part of a physical ailment and that was the prescribed medical guidance at that time. Uh, we have much better medical guidance right now. And so that is not your, your verse to say, oh, I'm going to go drink a whole bottle of wine so my stomach doesn't hurt. Okay. Verse 24 and 25 are really, really important because, um, well, let me read them and then we'll explain. Verse 24 says, the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind. And so what that's talking about is that when people are engaged in sin, when people are doing things outside of the will of God, there's some things that are super duper obvious that even if you're not looking for it, you can find out. So if someone is having an affair and then they're confronted by the spouse, people are yelling, you're throwing clothes, you know, out into the driveway, telling this person to get out. The neighbors are going to know about that. That one's pretty obvious, right? But then there's the sins of others that trail behind them. And those are sins that may not be immediately recognizable to other people. So if someone has um, an addiction with pornography or maybe is, is drinking like just late at night after their family goes to bed or whatever, people may not know about it, um, but those things are still trailing behind them. So if you're engaged in something and you're like, hey, man, I'm, I'm free. Uh, nobody knows I'm doing this. I'm the only one who knows it's doing this. Um, that's actually not true. God knows that you're doing that. And there's still going to be a consequence for those things. So obviously in verse 24, uh, we don't want to be engaged in super obvious things that, that are identifiable to people, even if they're not even trying to look for it. Uh, but we also don't want to be engaged in sins that we think um, nobody knows about. Nothing bad is happening, so I'm going to keep doing it. Paul says those, those trail behind them, and they're eventually going to catch up with you. And so I just want to encourage you today that if you're, you're engaged in something that, um, that's not right by God, and you think you're getting away with it, there, there's going to come a time where that, that will catch up to you. And so my encouragement to you is, is, is to cut that thing off or cut that person off or that situation off now before the consequences of those things catch up with you. There's still going to be consequences for what you've done, um, but that doesn't mean that you're getting away with it or that they're not going to eventually catch up to you because they will. And so in verse 25, uh, Paul's going to do the flip side of that and talk about good deeds. Paul says, in the same way, good deeds are obvious uh, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. So there's some things um, that, that we do. We, you never do a good deed or bless someone so that you get 
acknowledgement for. That should never be your, your primary focus. That should never be the main reason that you do things. But there are things that you do that are obvious to other people. So again, if, if someone has a flat tire and you go pick them up, that person obviously knows. Anybody seeing you uh, pick them up or change their tire is going to know. So that, that's obvious to other people. But even the things that, that we do in secret, you know, God would say, don't, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing as far as like getting accolades for good deeds. Uh, but even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. And so I want to let you know that, that if, you're, if you're helping people, if you're praying for people, if, you, if you're blessing people financially or, or emotionally or whatever, um, and even if you're not like making a big spectacle and that person's not bringing a lot of attention to it, that, that God is going to reward you for being faithful to that person, especially those things that, that aren't done in a, in a public, obvious way, um, that those things, in the same way in verse 24, that those sins that you're doing that you think no one knows about that will catch up to you, um, in the same way in verse 25, there may be things that you're doing that aren't obvious to everybody, but the blessings of those things will definitely catch up to you instead of verse 24, the consequences of those sins um, coming up to those. So with that, we're ready to start chapter six and we'll be able to do a couple of verses in six and then we'll finish that up on um, the next time we get going. So in chapter six, um, Paul's gonna continue to tell Timothy some of the concerns about just everyday life and, and how we do things and what, um, what we should be doing and not be doing. So let's go ahead and get started with verse one. It says, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. And praise God, we don't live uh, in a time or in a society where there is slavery. Um, and I know some people would say like, oh, my, my boss is a slave driver and it's basically like I'm enslaved. No, you're not. You get to go home. Uh, you have your own life. Now your boss may give you a hard time while you're at work, um, but you're still not a slave. You're not property of that person, right? But regardless of that, when we work, when we work under somebody, remember when we prayed for leaders in chapter two, when we, when we are under somebody and they, and they have a position over us, um, whether within the church or outside of the church, um, to really treat them worthy of full respect, even though they may not be a perfect person. Why? So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Okay, the worst thing that a Christian can do while they're at work is to slander their boss, downplay their boss, talk bad about their boss. Why? Because all the lost people are doing the same thing. And then so you don't look any different than someone who's not saved. Now, as a Christian in a work environment, uh, and maybe your boss is not the greatest person, uh, maybe they're not saved, maybe they, they do um, unethical practices or even illegal practices, and that doesn't mean that you don't bring those up, it doesn't mean that you don't voice your concern, but you're not supposed to slander that person, and you're supposed, still supposed to treat them with respect, even if the way that they're living doesn't warrant respect. Because what that does is that shows that you have honor and concern first and foremost for God right? Because Paul is telling Timothy in chapter six, hey, anybody who is a slave or anybody who is under somebody else should treat their masters worthy of respect. And so that's a command that, that God is giving all of us, that regardless of how you feel about your boss or your immediate supervisor or, or whoever on your project lead, if that applies to you at work, um, is to be able to treat them with full respect, to treat them with full respect, even if they're not living up to that standard, because that's going to let people know that you're different. It's going to let people know that, that you, first and foremost, love and respect and revere God, and so that you, in turn, treat other people like that. Remember, our, our, our two main commandments are to love God and then to love people. So our vertical and then our horizontal, uh, to love people. And so what that does is that may cause your boss or supervisor, and even if they don't say it out loud, at some point they're going to say, I'm kind of a jerk to this person, but they're still respectful to me. They're, they're not just, you're not just going along with everything they said and engaging and and illegal and, and unethical activities. And if your boss is telling you to do something um, illegal, then you go to human resources or whatever avenues you have because God doesn't want you to participate in something illegal just because your boss says so. But if your boss is maybe, maybe not handling something the right way in line with what the Bible says, you still treat them with respect to show the change that God has made in you. And that way, God's name and the teaching that Paul is giving Timothy can't be slandered. Because the way that we get slandered as a church and, and, and locally and, and globally is when we act the same way as lost people. And that's when people say, oh, look, see, they're hypocrites. They say all this stuff, but they don't live that way, right? And so you're under, you're under a microscope as a Christian. 
and people are, there's some people that, that you may know or work with or be related to, and they're looking for any opportunity that they can to be like, see, they're a liar. They say all this stuff. They don't really love God. And so verse one is telling us to treat people worthy of full respect, even if they're not living up to that standard. It says, it says they should consider their masters worthy of full respect, even if they're not a good master or a good boss or a good supervisor, because we're showing that we're under the order and the headship of God and that the teaching that we're going over is to show that we're to treat them rightly. So again, bring up concerns, especially if they're illegal or unethical. Um, if, if you have say like, hey, maybe this will work better this way, do that in a loving way. Not be like, oh, you're so stupid. Why don't you just do it this way? I don't see how you got to be a boss. I'm smarter than you. I should be your boss. That's not what we're doing. Because again, that's what lost people are doing to bosses that are not worthy of full respect. But as we treat masters or bosses or supervisors worthy of full respect, that shows that we're honoring God's name and living out the teaching that not just Paul is doing here in 1 Timothy, but in all scripture to be able to do that. Verse 2 of chapter 6, those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. These are the things that you are to teach and insist on. So, again, not slaves, praise God. Uh, but if you have a boss who is a Christian, you should be treating them even better than the boss who may not be worthy of full respect, who's not saved, uh, because even though they're above you or a supervisor above you, you're still on equal footing as far as the kingdom of God goes, that you're equal uh, and as a brother, as a sister, um, you may treat them as a spiritual father, or maybe they're younger than you. We go back to those, those verses in the chapters previously, that you are to be able to teach, um, to treat them well. And these are the things that you are to teach and insist on. So he's telling Timothy, hey, really make sure that people are being respectful, even if their boss is not so great, even if their master is not so great, but especially if they're a Christ follower. And so sometimes that's hard when maybe you are more spiritually mature than your boss, like you're both saved, but you, you're at a position where you know more or you're more mature in Christ, um, that does not give you the ability to say like, well, I know more, so I should be the boss because I know more in Christ. Um, you still fall under the parameters of your job, but to make sure that you're doing that in a loving way. Verse three, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to ungodly teaching, verse four, they are conceited and understand nothing. Okay. So Paul's basically saying, hey, if you don't, if you don't agree with this, if you don't like what I'm saying, um, then you don't know what you're talking about. Being conceited means that you think that you're right. Being like, oh, I, I know all the answers. I don't have to listen to Paul. I don't have to listen to Timothy. I don't have to listen to any pastor. I know what's right and, and I know what God wants. Then he's like, you really don't understand anything. There, there is no point in Christianity and biblical study for you to say like, uh, I read this scripture. I see what it says. Uh, I don't like that. I want to do this other thing instead. When we do that, even if you don't say those words out loud, what you're saying is that I know better than God. Because remember, God is talking to Paul. Paul is talking to Timothy. Timothy is talking to the church in Ephesus. And then we are all reading this epistle or this letter that was specifically to the church in Ephesus that was also circulated to other places because these sound doctrines apply in all situations. So anytime you read a scripture and you say, eh, I don't know, I don't want to do that. I want to do this other thing. Even if you don't verbalize it, you're saying, I think I know better than God. And so Paul says in the front of verse four, they're conceited, they're focused on themselves, and they really don't understand anything. He goes on to say, they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil, and evil suspicions. Goes on in, in the next verse as well. Um, it says when, when they're conceited and they don't understand anything, they're more interested in having controversies or quarrels fighting about words, having strife, malicious talk, and all this thing, then they are about really following the word of God. And so we definitely don't want to have anyone who's, who's teaching or leading or contradicting the Bible because they're really just following their own um, interest to like stir up trouble or make, make trouble or have drama. And, um, you know, you say, well, I, maybe I don't, I don't see that a whole lot in, in my local church, but anybody who's not following the word of God and is saying, oh, let's follow this other thing instead are the very same people that Paul is talking about in chapter one to say that they're teaching unsound doctrine. And so if, if there's something that you read as we kind of get ready to close right now, if there's something that you 
that you read and you don't like it, like just at a very base level, like, oh, that's hard to hear. I don't, I don't know about that. That's too hard. I don't know. You need to talk to God about that because what, what's in the word of God, this is not like a buffet where you just pick and choose what you want and say, well, I like this verse. I'll take this one. Oh, this verse is hard. I'll, I'll put that back, right? That if you, if you believe scripture for, for one thing, then you have to agree on the totality or the entirety of scripture. That you can't say, well, this part's right, but I think Paul was wrong when he said this. Either it's all right or it's all wrong. And so when, when you're reading and you're studying and you're talking to somebody about something, if, if they bring up a scripture that you don't like, what you, need to, what you need to not do is go into your mind and try to rationalize it and figure out if that's right or not. You, you need to bring that concern to God and say, Lord, I read this scripture. I don't like it. I don't understand it. It's confusing to me and allow God to be able to teach you. Uh, it's not, not a person or um, a, a situation. God himself will teach you the truths of those things. But we have to be willing to humble ourselves to God and say, Lord, teach me because I don't, I don't understand it. I don't like it. Um, that seems too hard. That seems contradictory. I don't understand that. And allow God to be able to work in your heart to, to do that. So we're going to go ahead and uh, pray and be dismissed. Uh, from our from our digital session here, but I, I really I miss you guys. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys Thank you so much for watching these things um, that this is not about me This is not about Northside Community Church um, this is about people drawing close to God in intimacy And so I, I pray that that's uh, what's been happening through these sessions and then also um, Through the services that are online and Wednesday prayer services and other we have lots of different things going on uh, Trying to meet the needs of God's people as best we can during these trying times And um, so that's how I want to close out in prayer. So if you could join me in that um, I'd really appreciate that as well. Father, I just pray, Lord, as, as these restrictions continue to, to go on, Lord, um, I just pray that above all things that your word is preached and taught, Lord, accurately, and that people are not trying to pick and choose different parts or try to change it to say what they want it to say, Lord. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that if we have, we take issue or, or have concerns about things or read something that's really hard to, to understand or really hard to apply, that we would we would stop and spend time with you in prayer so that you can reveal it to us, God. You are, you are the best teacher, Lord. You are the best preacher of your own word, God. And so I just pray that you would help us to understand and then to apply these things in our life, God, and that we would trust in you uh, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what is happening uh, with the world health situation or maybe what's happening in our finances or our household, and that we would trust you above all things, God, that we would choose to stay within the, within the confines of your will uh, so we don't go outside of that and cause trouble for ourselves or for others, God, and that we would just trust you with everything that we have, God, and do things your way and not our own way, God. So Father, we thank you, Lord, and we love you. Jesus, you're, you're awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. I'll see y'all next